The image of God's love is shown to us in a very special way. Hello, my name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Television. It is the weekend and we are looking at something interesting. As we teach today and as we open up the Bible today, here is what we're going to focus on. The image of God's love for us is shown. He sees us how we will be. That is amazing. And it's hard for us to realize, but it's true. And that's what we're going to talk about on today's program. It's very interesting. Corey, what are you talking about? Today we're going to be clearing up some misconceptions about the history of the Old Testament. History of the Old Testament? That should be really good. And Ryan, today, what are you talking about? Well, today we're talking about the scientific discovery of the sphericity of the Earth. Now, who discovered Earth was a sphere, and when was this discovery made? The sphericity, that's the discussion of the Earth as a sphere. Indeed. Fascinating. They come up with terms and names for everything. And so here it is. We're going to do all of this and much more for you with scripture reading and everything else. So get your Bible guide out and get your Bible out as we begin to study through the Word of God. It is an exciting day. Here now is Corey with today's study. The first thing that I'd like us to explore today together is how concepts and the history that we find recorded in the Old Testament of the Bible, how that compares, fits into, and even contrasts what we find written in history from the same time period of Old Testament history, but from different sources. So first, let's take a look at some creation mythology. The book of Genesis claims to be a compilation of written records kept by the early generations of man. The histories in Genesis were presumably written and passed down through the family of Adam by his son Seth, and then from Noah's son Shem down through Abraham until they reached Moses. The first few chapters of Genesis discuss the creation of the universe, mankind, and his purpose. But Genesis is not alone in this. Some of the most ancient non-biblical records contain creation mythology. There are intriguing similarities and differences. In both the pagan beliefs and Genesis, creation is initiated by the spoken decrees of a god. The beginning form of the earth is dark and filled with water, and dirt is an ingredient in humanity. Generally, in pagan beliefs, there is one God who oversees the creation process. But unlike Genesis, the pagan stories also have many other gods. They commonly render creation as being the result of a war of the gods or the death of a god. Also, there are gods who are personifications of nature, like the sun, moon, earth, water, or sky. Whereas in Genesis, these are simply physical properties of the earth and universe. An important difference is the purpose of creation. In Genesis, man is the center. Creation is directed towards providing for humans and installing humankind to represent God to creation. While in the pagan accounts, this is the opposite. Man is created to serve the gods, providing for their physical needs. If Genesis were an accurate ancient account, we would expect it to have some similarities with the oldest traditions of humanity, but to have important distinctions as well. And that's exactly what we find. Now, there's a lot of people, and I'm sure you've heard it before, especially when it comes to um, the creation account found recorded, of course, in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, um, and various other creation mythologies from different cultures. I'm sure you've heard somewhere that the Bible is simply a copy of other creation mythologies. Um, now, that's a great claim if you're trying to just tuck the Bible away in, in a neat little ancient history pile and not pay attention to it. But when you actually get into what the Bible actually says versus what is actually said by these other cultures, you realize that the contrast to what is different about them is actually way more important than what is similar about them. 
them. Now, this kind of theme, that concept, is repeated over and over and over again throughout uh, many of the histories contained in the Old Testament. There are lofty claims made by skeptics of the Bible, but when you actually examine them, they don't normally have a leg to stand on. The beloved in the Song of Solomon is the man who represents God in the universe. Now, the amazing thing about the Song of Solomon is that it shows how God is captivated by the image of the woman who represents the church. God is in love with us. It's hard to understand the significant details of this passage, but it is imperative to realize God loves us. Now, this is the message of the Bible. This love is not love defined in today's world, but love that the Bible defines in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is critical that we develop our relationship with God in His presence of love. Song of Solomon 4, verses 1 through 11. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like the flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amena, from the top of Sinir, and Hermon from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, and one link of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse! How much better than wine is your love, and the scent of your perfumes than all spices! Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. The Song of Solomon is an amazing passage of Scripture because it is a play, if you would. It's a, a script write uh, about a man and a woman. And they have witnesses like the daughters of Jerusalem and so on. And this is amazing. Janice has just read for you uh, an outstanding piece from Scripture. And I want to encourage you to open your mind here because this is amazing that it's in the Bible. Now, I want you to remember a few things. Number one, that sex is God's idea in the covenant of marriage, in a covenant of marriage, very important, and only marriage. It's important for us to understand that. And number two, I want you to realize that our experience as husband and wife bring an experience of God's relationship with us to the world. So marriage is a witness. And that's very important that we realize before we actually jump into the study. We have entered the study of the Song of Solomon, and I encourage you to get the Bible guide so that you can get your copy and study with us. It's really good. Now, our wisdom today is obvious. Wisdom in love. 
Now, I speak of love in terms of love for, from not only the general sense between a man and a woman, but also love between God and a man and a woman. God loves the man, then the man loves God, God loves a woman, and the woman loves God, and so on. We're going to explore it in that context, and this particular passage is fascinating. Our reading is Song of Solomon, chapter 4 to 6. I encourage you to read that. If you do, you'll go through the Bible with us and continue to read. Now, our focus today is on Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, we're not going to go through 1 through 11. We're going to go through verse 8 so far in the reading. But as we read this, I want to slow down the verse and I want to understand what is God saying to you and what is God saying to me. Now, we go to Song of Solomon chapter 4. We've already started in 1, 2, and 3. We go to Song of Solomon chapter 4 and here is what we read. Behold, you are my fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. And your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. And your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely, and your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory on which hang thousands of bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like the two fawns, the twins of gazelles, which feed among the lilies. Now, this is an amazing passage of Scripture. Now, we want to look at this and begin to understand what God is saying. The image of God's love for us shows how He sees our character being changed. Now, one of the things I want to mention to you, and I want to make sure that we understand, God sees us when he looks at us and he loves us and he provides for us. He sees us not as we are, as we shall be. God has the amazing, totally amazing ability to see us how we're going to be. Now, I know that's hard because I can't even do that. I mean, I look at myself and I think, wow, Lord, I'm a kind of a mess. And, but God sees me. He looks at me and he sees, he's placed Jesus Christ on me to protect me and make me what I'm going to be. He sees me as I will be. That's how God sees me. And that's how God sees you as you will be. That is very exciting. As we think about that and, and, and as we realize that, we need, to, we need to understand what God is saying here. And in verses chapter six of chap, or verse uh, chapter four, six and seven, it says, "Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of holy frankincense. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you." That is amazing. And as we see this, the image of God's love for us is seen in us. Without God, we are incomplete. One of the things that God does when you invite Jesus Christ into your life and you say, Lord, take the throne of my life, be in charge, is the love of God becomes the throne of your life. And, and he begins to run you and you begin to act and react differently. Over time, things change. And it's important for you to realize now there are some believers who things don't change quickly. And when that happens, you need to ask yourself the question, is Jesus Christ in charge of my life? Or am I constantly taking it back from him? We need to make sure that the Lord Jesus Christ is on the throne of our hearts. He's in control of our lives so that he has the ability to take over for us when we can mess up. And God will do that. He will bring his love into our hearts, his strength into our lives. So important. We go on to verse 8 of chapter 4, and here is what we read. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amania, and from the top of Sinir, and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains, and of the leopards. And God begins to engulf himself in this great passage of Scripture. The image of God's love makes us know the care and the love that he has for us. This is amazing. And again, I say that a lot, don't I? This is amazing. Well, it is amazing. It's exciting 
because God is showing us that he cares for us and that he loves us with a passion, a passion. And God is divine in his love. Now there's a difference between the love of a man to a woman because we're under sin. And we cannot really love a woman without the help of God. And so to make our marriages work properly, to make our relationships work out, we need Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to give us the love that's necessary to love our wives and our husbands. And it's important that you know that because when we marry people, we say, in the name of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we dignify and we make this covenant solid, the marriage covenant. God loves us, and he does so in such a way that is unbelievable. And as we begin to look in his face and see that, we begin to understand his love. to shift gears here with you in our historical studies and I'm going to take a look specifically at the authorship and the composition of the book Song of Solomon or Song of Songs depending on it's, it's two different titles for the same work of ancient literature. The book of the Old Testament entitled the Song of Songs is accurately translated as the Song of Songs which is Solomon's. Embedded in the title and in historic tradition is this book's claim of authorship, King Solomon of Israel. In the past, some have claimed the title may have been falsely added to give credibility as scripture due to Solomon's reputation as a biblical writer. With analysis, however, it becomes clear that the title was written right into the lyrical nature of the book. Typical in Hebrew poetry is the use of numbers. In Song of Songs, those are 3, 7, and 10. There are three overall sections of the book, seven subsections, and sevenfold and tenfold praise sections. Within the text, a specific word for love is used exactly 10 times, and with the instance of Solomon's name in the title, Solomon appears exactly seven times, twice in the first section, three times in the middle section, and twice again in the last section. Without the title, the pattern of numbers and organization is broken. The title was literally written into the content of the book. As love poetry, the Song of Songs is not alone in this ancient genre, but it is unique. There is love literature from ancient Mesopotamia that, while similar in theme and terminology, is strikingly different in use. The Mesopotamian literature references mythology, was used in rituals, was explicit, and emphasized fertility. None of these elements are found in Song of Songs. A greater parallel is found in ancient Egyptian love songs, though even in these cases, the Song of Songs is much more elaborate. What the Egyptian songs do accomplish for biblical studies is to spread awareness that love poetry may have been an ancient genre that the biblical writer was using as a means of communication. I want to thank you on the website for watching us and being a part of us and writing to us and being faithful to us. We've been able to succeed somewhat and thank you so much for that. But if you're watching on the website, I need to tell you something. Did you know that China, and if you're watching in China, hello, it's great to see you and it's great to have you watching. But I need to tell you this, that your watching on the website isn't enough. If you can give, that is really important because giving is so amazing. And I want to tell you something. We have a lot more people who watch on the website than actually give. I can tell because I know what our partnership base is who gives and I know how many people watch on the website. There's a lot of people who watch on the website. And I'm hoping that maybe one or two people can, uh, out of every thousand, can just give something and be a part of this because we do need your help. Uh, we need your help in the staff pay. We need your help in everything. So if you can help us, please do so. And the address is on the screen. It's P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. 
The United States PO Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150 or BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Well, it's time for Cosmic Mysteries, but before we go to that, it's very interesting because the next time on the show, mm -hmm. Quick Study Television Program, we're going to be studying this in the teaching segment. God sees us as being beautiful instead of all the problems that we see now. That's very interesting as we study this, we're going to look at that, so that's going to be fascinating. Hope you join us for that. Right now, here's Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? Who was it that discovered that our Earth was not a flat Earth, but a spherical one? And when was this discovered? Well, some say that it was around the time of the famous explorer Christopher Columbus. But is this really true? Let's study. Many falsely believe that the concept of a flat Earth was embraced up until the time of famous explorer Christopher Columbus. Actually, the concept of a spherical Earth was nearly universally believed among knowledgeable people 2,000 years before the time of Columbus. In fact, the ancient Greeks provided several scientific arguments for the sphericity of the Earth. For one thing, they knew that a lunar eclipse is the shadow of the Earth on the Moon. They also observed that the shadow of the Earth was always circular in shape no matter what the orient of the Earth during the eclipse. They knew that if the Earth were disc-shaped, it would be round but flat and would cast circular shadows, but only when an eclipse occurred near midnight. For eclipses near sunrise or sunset, the sun's rays would strike a flat Earth obliquely and would produce an elliptical shadow, but not a circular one. The only shape that always casts a circular shadow is a sphere. Therefore, since the Greeks observed only circular shadows, they concluded that the Earth was spherical. A second proof for the Earth's sphericity was discovered through the travelings between Greece and Egypt. While traveling this major trade route, the Greeks noticed that the stars that were barely visible in the southern sky in Egypt were not visible at all in Greece. Conversely, stars barely above the northern horizon in Greece were not visible in Egypt. This is only possible if Egypt and Greece are at different locations along a curved surface. In modern day terminology, we would say that Egypt and Greece are at different latitudes. A Greek astronomer by the name of Eratosthenes, who was living in Alexandria, measured the Earth using this phenomenon over 2,000 years ago. He observed that on the summer solstice at noon, near Aswan in modern-day southern Egypt, vertical objects had no shadows. This is due to the position of the sun directly overhead. However, Eratosthenes noticed that when he was back in Alexandria during the summer solstice of another year, that at noon vertical objects did cast shadows. He realized that the difference in shadows was due to the fact that the two different locations were on an arc. Eratosthenes measured the length of the stick and its shadow in Alexandria and used trigonometry to find that the sun made an angle of 7 degrees with the zenith, the point directly overhead. 7 degrees is about 1 50th of the circumference of a circle, so Eratosthenes knew that the circumference of the Earth was 50 times the distance between the two cities. The answer that he got was within 1% of the correct value. Of course, even before this great revelation to the Greeks, the book of Job in the Bible, probably written around 2000 BC, reports that God drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. If the earth were flat, then there would be no boundary between light and darkness. Ancient biblical scholars knew of the sphericity of the earth before it was ever scientifically demonstrated. Interestingly, a common misconception is that the God of the Bible requires a blind faith from his followers, yet he has given us the means and insight to test the accuracy of his words through signs and other tools, and he wants us to. The psalmist tells us that the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. You know, there are a lot of people who criticize the Bible for teaching an out-of-date cosmology. However, as we've just seen, it was correct about the spherical Earth, even before we knew about it. Interestingly, many critics have also falsely accused the Bible of promoting an Earth-centered solar system where the sun revolves around the Earth. But this is not what the Bible says. One of the verses critics use is Psalm 19.6, where it says that the sun's rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing that is hidden from its heat. Now, it is true this verse does say that the sun is in motion, and guess what? This is completely and 100% correct. 
A rather recent scientific discovery is that although our planets do orbit around the Sun, the Sun also orbits around our own galaxy out in one of the spiral arms. And actually, the galaxy is in motion as well. So here we see that the Bible, which was written thousands of years ago, once again had a knowledge beyond our own. This is called foreknowledge and is extremely strong evidence that the scriptures are God-breathed as they claim. Fascinating. So, Ryan, you're saying that the scriptures are actually showing us that the sun and everything is in motion and that the scriptures actually correct. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I mean, this was thought to be something else, you know, but the Bible was actually teaching us something. Fascinating stuff. That's interesting, isn't it? It is. You learn from studying the scripture. You learn about the sky because the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork. Day into day they utter speech and night into night everybody knows. And that's something fascinating. That's a promise, by the way, from Psalms chapter 19. But also it's a promise that whenever we study the stars or the scriptures, we can learn about the stars. That is fascinating. Well, here is called a prayer. Many of us are tarnished, scarred, and scared because of the things people did to us when we were young. Children are the innocents that are often taken advantage of by troubled adults. In many ways, we are misguided as we grow, but Jesus Christ can heal us. In our time on earth, we cannot truly know and understand the meaning of various expressions of love intended for us. This world is in a fallen state, and we live in it. Currently, the sanctity of marriage is being ravaged by the civil laws of the land. But God has made a way for us to escape the beaten, tarnished shell created as we grew up. This is the truth of God's relationship with us. We are saved. We begin a transformation into what God desires for us. best thing in the whole world. I'll tell you what it is. It's nothing on this planet, but it is praying to the Lord Jesus Christ and asking him to come into your life. I did that some years ago and it changed everything. I'm so excited about living and I'm excited about what I have after my life. The truth is you might need to know who Jesus is because you may have never asked him because he says, come to me all you are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today. Thank <laughs> you.